we just finished talking about the mixing mindset, and now we're going to go ahead and talk about mix preparation. Now, you're not going to immediately hear or see the benefits of either of these two things, getting yourself in the right mindset or uh, preparing your mix, but they really do have serious consequences on the final outcome. And mostly this has to do with being comfortable, being relaxed, and making the mixing process as enjoyable as it possibly can be. So if you have a 100 track pop arrangement and you're sitting down to mix that and you do no preparation, you might be able to get off to a good start. You find a couple of sounds that you think are important. You bring them up, you start mixing, but suddenly you start to realize that with 100 tracks, you're having to scroll all over the place to find what it is you're looking for. That can be a serious pain in the butt and it starts to take the whole mixing process from being something enjoyable and it becomes really frustrating. So that's why preparation is really so key, and that's what we're going to be talking about here in this presentation. The first stage to mix preparation is actually mindset, and of course we covered this in the last video, 30 full minutes of it, but in greatly simplified terms, if you're not feeling motivated to mix on a certain day, don't force it. There are some artists, and I mean people who make music and also mix it, some artists are going to really love the mixing process, and others may kind of feel like it's just work to them. So this comes down to you and your own being, but you have to remember that mixing is just as critical of a stage as making music to the final song that comes out the other end. And if you, if you can recognize that, you'll understand why it's so important to go through that mindset. You need to convince yourself and get yourself into a state of mind where this process is just as important as everything else that you've already done. Now, there's a big difference between lacking motivation and just procrastinating, and you obviously know that difference. All of you can think back to your school days of getting homework and thinking of every excuse on the book as to why you don't want to sit down and do that, um, as compared to being like really sick and just incapable of sitting down and doing your homework, right? So the same thing is kind of true with mixing or with making music or anything, really. Uh, there's a difference between not being able to and then just procrastinating. So there are some good excuses as to why you may not want to mix on the day that you've planned to mix your song. You wake up and you're feeling really sick. Your boyfriend or girlfriend potentially is just broken up with you. Or maybe you unexpectedly went to a heavy metal concert the night before. Now with the, the second one in particular, I'd say with the first and third, these are things that are really going to alter the way you're perceiving sound and therefore could alter your mix. With the second one, we're talking about something that's more emotional. And I'd say for me personally, I know I wouldn't be able to mix the next day if that sort of a thing happened to me. My mind would just be racing. I wouldn't be able to get in and focus. But for some of you, and I said this before in the last video, rare, but it still happens. If mixing works as a meditation to you, if you're really depressed or down in the dumps or something has happened and it's really consuming your mind, actually sitting down and mixing might be the very best thing for you. So this is just a matter of uh, personal characteristics and, and how you feel about mixing and, and maybe the way it makes you feel as well. So ultimately, what you have to do here is set a day, plan accordingly, and then just get in there and do it. Oftentimes, it's just getting started that's the hardest part. So if you can get yourself in there and starting to do some of the processes, even if it's not identical to what I'm recommending here, but just getting in there and getting started usually gets the wheel turning. And uh, after 10 or 15 minutes, you've really broken through that initial hurdle and you're ready to really uh, make a fantastic mix. Stage two is DAW selection. Now, I wouldn't normally put this in, especially for this beginner level class, but it is an important consideration and something that a lot of people do discuss. Now, normally you should have no problems mixing in the same DAW you make music in. The reason being, mixing is all about being relaxed and by extension, being comfortable. And if you think back to the very first article that was published on the Sermeno website, we talked all about that comfort threshold and just how important that is to making music. So it would be logical, or one would assume, that you're going to be most comfortable in the DAW you're making music in, so why change it up for mixing? Now, some people, and this was me at a certain point in my life, really hate mixing in some DAWs but love making music in them. If that's the case, I can see the argument for mixing in a different DAW. 
More commonly, though, you'll find this is done by professionals if they feel one DAW will allow them to mix faster and in a more efficient manner. That being said, there is no perfect DAW for mixing as everyone is different. So if you were to ask me or say, I really hate mixing in my current DAW, which one should I use? I'm not going to have an answer for you. But I can give you one example, and it's a personal example. I used to make music in a particular program, and I have a really small computer, and I always just get ones that are, you know, are smaller, they're easier to travel around with and whatever. But when it would come time to mix, uh, I was finding I was having so many problems in kind of getting to where I wanted to get, getting the plugins on there, whatever, and I really just couldn't do it. And it wasn't a matter of... Uh, I was just procrastinating or I was just making excuses. I literally was unable to make the mix in there. And so at that point, I had to find something different that was going to fit my screen appropriately that I could then mix in a lot more comfortably. And I found that program and that was the way I did it for a long time. Now I make music and I mix in the same program, but it hasn't always been that way. So for you, I'd say if it's your first time mixing and you're just struggling, chances are it's not the DAW that's getting in the way, it's your own head. But if you're consistently struggling mix after mix after mix just in terms of um, feeling comfortable and being able to find what you need to find, that's when you might want to consider then uh, using a different DAW to mix in. But for the most part, for this course, for a beginner course, none of you should have too many problems mixing in the DAW that you're making your music in. And if you are there's a good chance that it might just be because your mindset isn't in the right place. All right, so stage three is the actual prepping of the stems and really just getting yourself ready to start pulling things up and finally listening to something. So you begin by loading stems. After you've loaded these stems, you're going to sort them, rename them, and color code them. And of course, there's a variety of methods for doing this. Uh, my recommendation is at the beginning with the preparation, Think only about relevant groupings and think about this from as broad a perspective as you can. So I put some examples here, drums, synths, guitars, vocals, etc. You know, whatever you feel that number should be of different groupings. And again, I'd say keep it broad, but everybody's different. So some people like to get more specific than others. At this time, don't worry too much about sorting within those groupings. And when I say groupings, I don't literally mean putting them into a group track. I just mean color coding them all the same way and putting them one after the other. Uh, however, if there is an order that you prefer, like a lot of people always have the kick drum as the top thing in that little drums grouping, like I always do that, then by all means, go ahead and set it up like that. But we're going to talk about this a little bit more later on and how you might sort things a little bit differently based on perceived level of importance. And right now with the sorting, we're not asking that question of what's the most important thing. We're just trying to make our lives easier by seeing each section in a different color. And here I have my own opinion, and I'm going to explain why here in a second, but I recommend doing as much of this as possible without any listening. If something is so terribly misnamed, then listen to that part in solo and do your best not to make any judgments about that part. So you might listen to, like, let's say something's named like just ASDF, blah, 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 all sorts of keys. You listen to it, it's a shaker. And upon listening to that shaker, you're like, oh my gosh, this is way too dull. This needs like a serious EQ curve. You do not want to think that at this moment because you have not listened to everything in context and you have not made any determinations yet. Only after you start putting things in together in context should you start thinking, does this need to change? Because that's what mixing is all about. It's a balance. So if you're listening to something in solo, don't start thinking about how you need to process it because there's a chance that maybe it's already the perfect sound that's going to fit and you won't need to do it based on everything else that's going on. So why prep to begin with? There's nothing fun, unique, or creative about prepping, so why do it when you could just pull up a fader and get started? I've talked about this on the first slide already, but here are the bullets. Number one, organization. You're setting yourself up for later. You're making your life easier later down the road. You're going to be able to find things, and uh, that's really, uh, really uh, very, very valuable in the grand scheme of mixing. Number two is speed. You can work a lot faster when you've prepped things because you've moved them around. You're starting to make those connections of, okay, I put the drums here. I put my synthesizers over here. Uh, it's just going to make that process a little bit quicker. And then prepping also can serve as a good warm up. So you're in there, you're in the DAW, you have all the tracks. It's a good reminder to you 
as to what is going to come. So you know that you're about to jump in there and get into mixing. So it's a great way to just kind of focus yourself without actually doing any listening, just kind of a little mental uh, preparation that I find to be somewhat useful, uh, at least during the preparation stage. So we're going to go through a very quick example here. I'm not going to let you listen to anything, but I'll just show you how I would bring them in and how I might sort things and what it's going to look like at the end. All right, so I went in and I started up a new project and I immediately went in and just pretty much cleared everything out. So I don't have any audio tracks. I don't have any send and return. We will get to that later in this section. But what I'm really concerned with doing is just bringing in all of my stems here, okay? So I'm gonna head down into the little um, sample browser here. I've already put this in a folder. And the first thing I notice is that the format here is 44.1 16-bit. So I just wanna go into my preferences and just to increase efficiency here, I'm gonna go ahead and set the project to be 44.1 for consistency. You could obviously upsample all of these if you want to make your plugins possibly work at you know higher fidelity but I really can't hear the difference and I'm not too concerned with it it's not going to make or break this song so 44.1 is fine I've also increased the buffer size mainly because I'm not too worried about playing anything back in that much real time like I'm not going to be playing in a synthesizer part or anything so having that extra buffer is just going to free up more space and uh, should make it so that I'm not peeking out my CPU early on in the mix process uh, eventually there's a good chance I might push this to 2048 but for now I think 1024 or 512 would really be uh, sufficient so I click OK I'm going to grab all of these parts here and in this program, I just hold shift and it's going to put everything on different tracks. You'll have to consult your own documentation for uh, what you do. I'll just bring them in here at this point. It doesn't matter where I put them. And I'll just zoom out now. I don't really need this anymore. And I'll take all of these audio tracks and I'm going to bring them back to the beginning. Let's just go ahead and make this... Uh, a little bit easier. Nice. So they're all now back here at 111. Uh, some people will give themselves a little bit of a buffer at the beginning. Uh, that's completely up to you. I'm fine with starting right on the 111. And now the next thing I'd have to do is go in here and start to sort things based on parts. And then I'm going to color code them. So it's brought everything in here at different colors by default. So this is fairly confusing to look at, right? Just from a technical perspective. Uh, I don't know where everything really is. You'll also notice that the naming, there are numbers in front of a lot of these things. They don't necessarily seem to be related in any way why some have numbers of, of whatever value. And you could go in and take all of those, get rid of them, but I'm fine with leaving them because I can still read everything. So for example, I might say, okay, let's start by getting any sort of drum and percussion element together. And like I said before, I'm starting on a very macro kind of general level. I'm not going to worry about um, if it's... Uh, if it's percussion or if it's a drum part at this point. So I have uh, my bell, my conga, my crash. These are all percussion or drums. So I'll just take them all and I'm going to choose a color for these guys. I'm going to go with like, a, I don't know, let's pick something a little bit more bold than that. Let's go with this purple. I'm going to go and start looking for all of the drum parts and just bringing them up here. So snare, that has to be a drum part. Tom layer, that's drum and percussion. Let's see, just scroll down. And find all of them, snare layer. So I'm just, this takes a little bit of time, but this is basically the process that you're going to go through. Let's grab all of those and also make them the same color. Cowbell, we'll bring that on and up. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play this in super fast time now, and you're going to see what this looks like at the end. Okay, cool. So as you can see, uh, this track worked out quite nicely. 
there's a lot of drum elements. And again, this is just a very broad approach that I'm taking here. A lot of drum elements, basic guitar elements here, a lot of sort of like vocal stabs or things based off of vocal elements. The bass line, I almost always put in a different color just because that usually gets a lot of very special treatment and processing. And then a bunch of different synthesizer parts. So the next thing you might do here with the preparation is just look and see and ask yourself, do I want to actually go any further here? And I think in my opinion, I do because there are so many different drum elements that is going on here. I want to sort out what are the main drum elements from what's more of like the percussion. And also from looking here, I can see that there are some things that really are only meant to come together or should be put together because they're happening at the same time. So for example, this snare vary, this snare layer, this 808 clap, these things should all probably be sitting near each other. I don't need to change the color on those, at least not yet, but I do want them all to be together because they seem like they're designed to be played together and therefore you're gonna have to make a balance and combination. So I'll go through again, speed this video up, and I'm going to uh, now sort these drums just a little bit further because I think that how it is now would be a little bit too confusing for me. All right, so you can now see how I've really just, I changed the view here just to make this a little bit easier for you, but I've sorted some of these things out and I did actually have to go back and listen to one part to see if it was really a main drum element or not so much. So from looking at this and when this is in uh, the larger form, uh, you'll be able to see that there are certain elements that play a lot, like the kick, the snare, and the crash, and it's fairly consistent. So I would consider these things to be my main drum elements. That's why they're colored like this. This is that little snare and clap layered breakdown portion here. So I put those all together. Uh, pretty important because it happens at such a significant moment here in the song. And then you can see that with all of the percussion and other elements, I've kind of just sorted them like so. In the case of any delay effect, like you see here, the conga delay effect, I want to make sure I put those things together. So there might be another example here where I have a delay effect. So I have the Vox Woo and I have the Vox Woo delay. And I made sure to put those guys right next to each other since they're obviously related. And uh, with the synth run, and then I have a synth run delay, I didn't put those together. So let's just sort those guys out. And now we really have a really nicely prepped and color coded session, which should make mixing this entire thing uh, a heck of a lot easier than if we didn't do any of this sorting. Remember, if somebody's given you stems that are terribly named, go in there and rename those so you know what it is that you're uh, listening to. And other than that, you're now ready to mix this track. The very last thing I forgot to mention is tempo. And this is actually why starting at 111 is basically critical. Uh, you want to make sure that if you're working with any tempo sync delays or special effects, even if it's like compression, you could set, you know, attack and release times to be relevant musical intervals. You need to make sure that your session is in the exact same uh, BPM as whatever the song was created in. So I can tell from looking at this, number one, it's put everything into raw mode. So that's what I want for sure. I don't want to have any sort of time stretching going on. I want this to be raw, just the audio file, if at all possible. But it's definitely guessed the tempo incorrectly. And if you do have questions about what the tempo of a song is, uh, feel free to ask the person, number one, and they can just tell you. Or you can usually very easily figure it out. So in this case, and since this is a pop music track, I know that there's a good chance that the kick is going to start right at the end of some kind of four beat uh, duration. So right on the five, so to speak. And right now it's not doing that but I should be able to easily move it in there by just changing the session BPM. This isn't changing the playback at all. It's just moving these audio files. It's just changing like the display really. But this is important for if you then were to set say like a um, delay effect and you wanted it to be to quarter notes, if it's gonna be quarter notes at 110, but that's not actually the speed of the track you're working with, you need to put that into the right place. So if I go, I can even just do this by eye and you can see that it looks like you might think it would be like 120, but it's not. It's actually 121. And that's exactly the right tempo of this session of this song. And I also know that that's the right tempo of the song because I made it. 
So now you might notice that you've lost some of the displays. And if that's the case, you wanna go in and grab everything and just pull it out to make sure that you can see everything. So I'll just do that here for you quickly. And that is the final stage of our mixed preparation. Again, it's not the uh, sexiest thing in the world, but it is something very necessary if you wanna end up with a very sexy result. So uh, there you go. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, like always, don't forget to ask because I know that this topic can be a little bit confusing. So if you are struggling, don't hesitate to ask questions. Thanks a lot.